Oh, no. Shall we start? Sure. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dan Rocha talking about injector certificates for banana lettuces. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks everyone for showing up. So it's a small intimate group and I don't have a, I don't it, I don't have a jam-packed hour, so please feel free to interrupt me and ask some questions if you have them, um, or slow me down at some point. Um, you can see the, the title. So this is looking at some um, stuff with polynomial matrices, but not trying to actually do computations with them, but just trying to verify computations. Um, this is work that I did last year. I was lucky enough to be on sabbatical um, at the University of Grenoble um, in France, and we had some nice collaborations. So uh, Clément was one of my hosts at the university, and David Luca is his PhD student right now. Um, and then they had some existing collaboration with uh, Vincent from Limoges and uh, Johan Rosenkild from, uh, from Denmark. And I think actually there's some kind of grant that they had to visit France and Denmark or something. So Johan was visiting and then Vincent was there and we ended up working together on this paper, which has been great. Um, and so I want to just motivate the kind of algorithms, the kind of problem solving that we're going to be doing here. So normally you have, uh, you get some problem input, you have to compute the output. Uh, this is kind of the traditional model of computation. We think about there being one computer. Um, you have one shot at doing some computation, and that's it. And those are, that's great. I love that. So we can develop nice algorithms in this model. But there's uh, obviously some assumptions here which maybe make a little bit less sense in modern settings. Um, so in verified computation, the thing that's weird about it, the thing that's different but also exciting is that in verified computation we start with the answer. So we start with the question and the answer and then you have a much easier job, hopefully, of just saying was that, was that answer actually correct or not. Um, and this makes sense uh, with, for example, outsourced computing. So if you have a very small or not so powerful device, then you want to send your computation to the cloud or something. Um, or you're restarting computation, we're using different kinds of devices. You can also think about, uh, actually one of the areas where verified computing has seen the most attention is in high performance computing. So in large distributed clusters, you may have a, yeah, a massively parallel computation that's distributed amongst many individual machines. And some of those may fail, some of those may have other things going on, or um, things can happen in the network. Uh, at the scale of supercomputing, those things do happen um, that we normally expect don't happen. And having some verification in the loop as you're doing your computation allows you to then restart the part of the computation that failed or um, some things similar to that. So the, the goal is that we want to be much faster than actually computing the result. That should be obvious. Uh, if you had all the time in the world, you could just recompute the results yourself. But the idea is to only verify and in some faster way. And the second one is, I think, important. We, we don't make any assumptions about the um, possibly wrong solution that we get. So there's no assumptions that the thing that we get is close to a correct solution or that it's uh, related to a correct solution or that it, um, that it used some particular algorithm to, to get to it or anything else. You're just given an answer and you want to know whether that answer is completely correct or not. And the goal of our verification algorithms should be that if the solution that we're given is correct, you should always accept. Um, so we don't want any failure of where you had an actually correct solution and your verification erroneously rejects it and says that it was wrong. That would be unfortunate. Um, but it, there is usually a possibility for error in the other direction. Um, so you might say false positives, which is to say accepting a solution which is not actually correct. And so the goal is uh, going to be develop algorithms where that's with controllably low probability. And because you have a one-sided error um, where you always accept a correct solution and usually reject an incorrect one, 
then if you're not happy about the probability um, that you currently have of accepting a false positive, you can just crank it up by repeating your verification algorithm and you get an exponential increase in the success probability. So this is kind of the setting that we're going to be living in. Um, I guess I could say more about motivation, um, but it's a, it's a well-studied area of uh, verified computation that's, I think, increasingly important as we have different ways of computing. Oh yeah, I wanted to say, like another, another aspect of what I mentioned as a downside to regular computing is that you have this assumption of a one-time problem. And I think another thing that we're seeing happen more as we outsource to cloud computing is that you don't actually know when your computation occurred. Maybe someone else asked for that same computation another time and you're getting the same result that they did. Um, so again, verified computing is just giving you safeguard against all of those kind of things. Um, oh yeah, and one more, one more motivation I'll tell you is for when you have Monte Carlo algorithms. So a lot of fast algorithms that are developed, especially in the context of computer algebra, are randomized Monte Carlo algorithms, meaning that the algorithm itself may give wrong results. And one way that uh, some of these verified computing methods are actually being used is just as a check for those Monte Carlo algorithms in software. So if you have an algorithm that is randomized and you know that it may give some incorrect result, then you can just run a verification step afterwards. If the verification, verification is very, very fast, like it should be, then um, it's cheap that then certifies that your, gives you more confidence that your result is correct. Um, what it do, it allows you to kind of cheat the probability, meaning uh, a lot of times in the Monte Carlo algorithms that we develop, we have very pessimistic bounds on the size of primes that you need or on the size of uh, the number of iterations that you need to run, et cetera. So if you have a fast verification algorithm, you have a lot more opportunities for early termination. You can run way below what the theoretical bound for correctness is, then try to run a verification, see if the result you have is actually correct. And if it is, you're done, you're happy. And the verification is independent of that algorithm, so there's no possibility for some kind of unluckiness uh, collusion there. Um, and then if you not, are not done, then you know that you're not done and you can add more primes or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Can you use, make a distinction between verification and certification? Uh, no, and I'm probably going to use them interchangeably. Um, yeah, I like verification better, but somehow in the literature they use this name of interactive certificates. To me, that's uh, like just a grammatically bizarre thing to say you have an interactive certificate, like a certificate should be a piece of data that you get, and you can use it to check your result. And the, everything that I'm talking about is gonna be in the interactive model, so I'd like to call that a verification routine. Um, yeah, and, it, and uh, I guess also along with that is that because they're randomized, it's different every time you do it. So another thing about a certificate is that I think of that as a one-time use piece of information. If you get a bad certificate, then you have a, a useless certificate. Um, whereas with the verification routine, you have this potential to run it again and again and increase your probability. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. So your own algorithm, or you know, the thing that you described is Monte Carlo itself, right? Yes. So you're supposed to use Monte Carlo algorithms or what? That's correct. That's correct. Now that's perverse. Um, but, the, but, the, but the answer is that we won't cheat on the balance on this algorithm, on the verification algorithm itself. So with this Monte Carlo algorithm, this Monte Carlo verification with a guaranteed um, low failure rate. So what you can do is you can use this fast Monte Carlo algorithm with guarantees to verify and check a uh, more complicated, more sophisticated Monte Carlo computation where you actually don't want to make the things large enough to have a guaranteed success probability. Um, so that's, that's kind of the idea, but you're right that it does seem weird. But it, it turns out to be useful in practice. Um, and I think also just because of the fact that it's a, independent from the algorithms that are being used to actually compute these things, um, you, you won't fail in the same way uh, twice, or you're unlikely to. And what if the, uh, the, the thing you want to verify uh, actually gives it a yes or no? Just this kind of answer, not, not like a huge domain, but just yes or no? Yes, actually we will see examples like that. 
And um, uh, like I'm going to talk about um, certifying whether a matrix is singular or not, or non-singular. And so that's a yes or no question. And in that case, you expect that the the server will the server who's verifying helping you verify the computation has to give you a little bit more, um, has to have more behind the scenes. But the uh, the one of the goals is that we don't ask the prover to do more computation than they would have had to do in order to compute the result in the first place anyway. So for example, a yes or no question like, is this matrix singular? To answer that question, you probably have to do some factorization of the matrix or something like that. So even if the person receiving the yes or no answer doesn't have that full computation, you assume that the server actually does. And then they can use that to um, justify that the matrix is not singular. So does your method work even for yes, no answer problems? Is yes. Problem? Yes, that was my answer too, Alexi. We'll see, we'll see an example. Um, so you'll see that obviously so something else is going to happen. Of the, the, the yes, no. That's correct. Um, OK, so there's, there's two kinds of approaches to verification that you'll see in the literature. One is generic approaches. And what these usually do is they say, if, you're, if you have an algorithm to solve any problem using some computational model of circuits or something like that, then you can transform that algorithm for actually computing the result into an algorithm for verifying the result that's already been computed. So you can imagine kind of saving some verification at each step along the way and then coming back and checking that each step of the algorithm was faithfully computed. And if you have a correct deterministic algorithm to perform the computation, then you can verify that step by step kind of following along the same way. Um, and we'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that. But this is, this is sort of what I've seen more of in the crypto world. Um, and based on computational hardness assumptions. And if you're not familiar with um, um, cryptographic literature, when we say something like based on computational hardness, what that means is that the probability of success or the, the chance that you are able to be tricked in a verification has to do with assuming you're uh, somebody that's trying to trick you can't do some cryptographic hard problem like um, find collisions in a hash or uh, decrypt some, some encrypted value without the key or something like that. Um, so the, that's a weaker kind of assumption than information theoretic security, which is what we get from the second kind of verification, which is uh, problem-specific verification. Um, it's not necessarily all of these things going together, but I, I notice that they tend to go together. Um, which is that, so for problem-specific verification, what we're doing is saying, here's this particular problem, not a general class of algorithms, but for this actual problem, let's uh, develop techniques to verify that one. And you can achieve much greater efficiency this way because you're not tied to following along the same steps as the algorithm that's used to do the computation. Um, but of course, it's more limited results because you're only going to be able to use it for um, that particular problem. But th so these are two different ways of getting at the same thing, which is to verify a computation, but very uh, qu quite different from each other. Um, an advantage, so I'm going to be showing some problem-specific verification algorithms. And so I'm, I'm like hyping up why that's great. Uh, I don't actually think that one of these is necessarily better than the other, but I happen to, in this work, do the second type. So I'm going to explain why that's useful, um, which is that it's also in, totally independent of the algorithm itself. So one thing that we're seeing um, increasingly in computation is that the algorithm, the method by which something is computed maybe isn't always revealed to the user. And that's a requirement in the first case. You have to know how the result was computed um, in order to verify it. And in the second case, the kind of problem-specific verifications we're going to look at uh, you don't actually care how the result was computed. You don't need to know. You just execute a second protocol afterwards to verify the result was correct. Um, so just a little bit more about generic verification algorithms. The general idea is that uh, you view your computation as an arithmetic circuit. So already there's some problems there because an arithmetic circuit is a more limited view of computation than something like a word 
uh, machine or something like that. Um, but you can view computations as arithmetic circuits. It's somehow equivalent to a Turing machine. And there's been a number of results. I'm, I'm listing three of them here, which I think are kind of different from each other and all interesting. But there's many, many more. So don't think that this is the end or the beginning of the uh, bibliography here. Um, so this, this one by Goldwasser, Kalai, and, and Rothblum is very efficient in terms of the time that it takes, but it uses a high power um, crypt cryptographic thing called uh, PCPs, PCP theorem, um, probabilistically checkable proofs, I believe. Um, the Pinocchio, so of course there's a follow-up paper to this Pinocchio one that's even a little bit better and they called it Geppetto. Um, Okay, so this is what people like to do in these kind of systems papers. So it's called Pinocchio because it'll, you can tell if it's lying with the nose growing. Um, so that's very evocative and exciting. This is a big paper. Um, notice that the title is kind of funny, I think, almost practical verifiable computation. So the big claim to fame in this one was that for a few specific problems, again, it's a general verification technique that could apply to any circuit, but then they applied it they actually implemented it and applied it to a few specific kinds of computations and said that the time to verify is for the first time just a little bit less than the time to do the computation yourself. So um, the reason why I mentioned that is that, again, these kind of generic verification algorithms are using high-powered crypto stuff. There's been a lot of impressive work, but they're still quite slow. You know, even the state of the art is just for some problems barely faster than redoing the computation yourself. So that's exciting. There's more opportunities for work to do there, um, but it's gonna be a different kind of universe than we're gonna live in. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I actually don't know much about the last paper, so I don't wanna to say too much about it because I haven't read it carefully, but I wanna point out that a lot of these are also interactive um, proofs, interactive verifications, uh, similar to what we're gonna see um, but for a non-generic method. Okay, so moving to problem-specific methods, what, we're, what I'm gonna eventually sometime talk about today is uh, some new verification algorithms for polynomial matrices. And I wanted to point out some of the literature there. So these are all problem-specific verification algorithms for linear algebra in particular. And you can see that this has been kind of a hot topic in the ISAC community recently. It really goes back to a paper from Freivalds in 1977, old paper, and that was, uh, had a very exciting title. Does anybody know the title off the top of their head? The, the title is something like uh, randomness can make algorithms faster sometimes. So it was, it was very early on when people were thinking about um, does randomness have the possibility of improving the speed of running time of our algorithms? Um, now I think we kind of all believe that, and, and people have Monte Carlo and Las Vegas randomized algorithms all the time. But this was uh, much earlier, so this is one of the first results along that direction um, where they were looking, uh, actually it was looking at a few problems, but the one that's cited most frequently is matrix, matrix multiplication. Um, and so there's a non-interactive uh, randomized certificate that you can, you can check whether a matrix matrix product is correct. Uh, Kaltoff and Nairig Saunders is a really interesting one. It's kind of halfway between the generic and the specific model. So what they can do is any algorithm which is based on matrix multiplication, they, you can run an efficient verification algorithm, f uh, a verification for that algorithm without actually having to do the matrix multiplications yourself. So if you're familiar with um, some linear algebra literature in the, in the theoretical um, kind of complexity theoretic sense, you'll see that, you'll know that a lot of computations end up having a cost which is proportional to n to the omega, like the cost of matrix multiplication. And in, for any such algorithm, you can just replace all the matrix multiplications by asking the prover to do the matrix multiplication for you, and then you check the matrix multiplication yourself using a Freibold's check. And so what that, what that does is you can essentially, there's some provisos to this statement, um, but you can essentially replace the exponent of omega in any complexity with a two. So you can, uh, for the verification. 
And so that's a very interesting idea, and it's a, it's a, it applies to many different problems because you can use it anytime when matrix multiplication is your bottleneck. Um, then looking at more specific uh, linear algebra problems, there is a lot of work to get determinant um, and matrix min poly working. So there's a, uh, there's a paper before this one as well, but then this one that you see from ISEC 2006. And then what, the way that a lot of these work is that there seems to be some crucial key ingredient, and then that gives a lot of other uh, certificates as well. So like the min poly turns out to be a really important one. If you can do min polys, then you can get the characteristic polynomial of a matrix without too much difficulty. And if you have the characteristic polynomial, then you can look at the constant coefficient of that and you can get the determinant. Um, you can look at the degrees of these things and get the rank. So uh, things start kind of falling out at that point. Um, okay. So here's an example of verification protocol, just in case you haven't seen these kind of things before. This is not for anything with linear algebra, um, but this is just for a stupid example uh, to see what's the structure of the kind of uh, verifications that we're going to see, the kind of interactive protocols that we'll see. So imagine that there's a claim that some company made X dollars of revenue last year. Now, you want to verify that that claim is true. So what can you do? Uh, what we're going to see is that we always separate into a prover and a verifier. So we think of the prover as the person that's kind of making the claim, that it's up to them, the burden of proof is on them, um, to do the work to convince the verifier that the claim is actually true. So what usually happens is we start by the prover having some kind of a commitment. So the prover has to put their stamp down on something, sometimes adding more information um, beyond the original piece of information they said. So in my stupid protocol here, I'm saying that to have a commitment passed uh, to justify that your company had X dollars of revenue last year, the commitment will be the amount of revenue that the company made in each month. Okay, so you get a list of 12 values. Now the prover has committed to those. And after that commitment, the verifier can issue a challenge. And this will usually be, this should be a randomized challenge. Um, so at this point, the verifier can pick a random month out of those 12. And after the prover has committed to saying, this is my revenues amount for all 12 months, then the verifier randomly picks one and says, hey, I want to check that month. Then the prover has a response, which is, in this case, they would send the receipts or something uh, from that month of revenues. And finally, the verifier does a check. And in this case, there's two kinds of checks. You have to check that the sum of the monthly revenues you got sent actually equals the claimed original revenue. And you have to check that the receipts match for that one month that you chose. So this is some kind of a verification algorithm for uh, a claim of revenue. And what's important is the flow and the order of these things. So if you started by having the challenge from the verifier, then it would be much more easy for the, trivially easy for the prover to trick you because they could just make sure that the value of that month that you're gonna check is correct and then inflate all the other values and make the revenue total be whatever they want it to be. Um, and again, this is a stupid example, so this is, I'm not telling you anything that's groundbreaking here. Um, but what I'm just trying to point out is that we, we frequently see this kind of a flow, commitment, challenge, response, and check. And the order of those is very important. Um, and you'll, so we'll frequently check. see things like this why with a few routes. Why 1 to 12, why 12? Because X, what is X? So X is the original claim that the, there was X dollars of revenue oh, last I see. year. Ah. Yeah. But I thought your check would be checking the receipts first. Well, you have to check both of these things. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really matter which order you check them in. And the, first, the first one is the kind of thing that you might not think, I mean, it seems like obvious that we should check that, but it's important to specify that in your protocol for the kind Maybe of things you can see. Right the challenge. You could, um, that's true. In this case, that would be totally yeah, fine. In ca this case, that would be totally fine. Sometimes the checks that you're doing are based on some um, secret choices that the verifier has made. And in, in those cases, you frequently don't want to do the check too soon because then by revealing to the prover that your check failed, that tells the prover something about the secret choices that you made. Um, so 
to make things easier, a lot of times we just put all the checks toward the end to avoid those kind of uh, hairy issues. Okay, so here's our specific setting. Um, I'm going to tell you about some interactive verification protocols um, between a prover and a verifier, and they're going to verify a claim. So for all of the things that we look at, there's going to be some claim that we verify, and the parameters, I'll remind you of all these things, this very wordy slide, um, but some, we have to have some jargon to talk about this. So there's, there's a notion of public information. Um, if you remember, I think one of the words in the title of this talk is something about low communication. So part of the way that we achieve that is we assume that the input and output are public information. So we're not going to count the time to communicate the input and output itself. We assume that's already known. Um, and I'll explain later why that's an important uh, assumption to make. So there's some public information. We just assume that everybody knows that already. It's not a secret. And then there's going to be other information which is transferred during the protocol. The two things that we need most of all for any verification protocol is completeness and soundness. So completeness and soundness has to do with the, um, the two things I was talking about earlier. Completeness means that if the answer is really correct, you always verify it. If the claim is, is correct, you always verify it. And soundness means that if the claim is not correct, then you probably don't verify it. Um, so if you don't have completeness, that's quite bad. It means that you're rejecting correct computations or correct claims. Um, but if you don't have soundness, it means that you're too allowing uh, and taking everything in. And then we want things to be fast. So we want the prover to be fast, um, but the prover can do a little bit more work because we assume the prover is like the cloud server or something that's done the actual computation in the first place. So we assume they have a bit more time to waste. Um, yeah, Chi. Um, is it? Um, well, you can also make define completeness to mean you always reject all claims. Yes, but that's not how we define it. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And, and that changes the class from, say, P to co and P or something. Something like that, yeah. Right? But for the class of prompts you do, does it really matter? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there will be possibilities of uh, false claims sneaking through. But for, there's, there's actually a few dozen verification protocols. I'm really going to tell you about the details of two of them. Um, but for different ones of them, they have uh, different properties. But we usually want this. Um, the idea is that the, the claim being true should be the typical situation, right? So the, whatever the claim is, that's the thing that the server has said that they computed for you. Um, so we expect that to be the case most of the time. And the claim being false should be an atypical situation that you're trying to catch that something went wrong. Um, you know, if you're doing a, I mentioned the application to distributed computing. The claim being true means that the distributed computation worked. Um, and yeah, so what, so for example, for, uh, for singularity, there's a separate certificate for, for certifying that a matrix is singular versus certifying that a matrix is non-singular. Um, so you don't certify the non-singularity matrix by failing to certify that it's singular. That doesn't tell you anything. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so then we want things to be fast, and I just wanted to emphasize that the verifier time, we assume, is much more restricted. The verifier is your cell phone or the master node of some big distributed computation that doesn't have so much time to waste. So what we're going to insist is that the verifier's time should be actually minimal. It's going to be linear in the size of the uh, input and output. So clearly, you have to read through. You have to touch every bit of the input and output output to have any confidence that it's correct. So if you didn't look at some part of it, then that part that you didn't look at could be wrong. Um, so that's kind of the fast that we could hope the verifier to be. And finally, we're going to have low communication, meaning that the amount of data transferred is actually much less than the size of the input and output. For the matrix problems we're talking about, the size of the communication is usually going to be like one row or one column of the matrix as opposed to the whole thing. OK, now I have to have a cautionary statement before we get into some meat, some actual protocols. Um, and my cautionary statement is that the, the paper that we wrote is all about polynomials. 
um, we're verifying um, polynomial matrix computations. And then everything I tell you from now on mostly is going to be about integer polynomials. There's two reasons for that. First of all, this is a talk, so there's no reviewers to complain that I'm lying to you, so I can say whatever I want. Um, that's nice. But uh, less facetiously, integer polynomials are easier, uh, uh, sorry, integer matrices are a little bit easier to present and to talk about. And uh, that's kind of the next place where I want to go with this anyway, so it's it was enjoyable and useful for me to think about the integer case a little bit in preparing this talk. Um, and for a lot of the things I'm going to see, I'm going to show you, the proofs almost surely go through for integer matrices as well as they did for polynomial matrices. Just somebody has to do the work of actually doing the analysis. And I'll point out where the proofs really don't go through yet. Uh, they might, but we don't know how to do it yet. Um, so, I, so this is my disclaimer about me lying to you for the rest of the talk. Yeah. But just so when you say polynomial matrices, you mean that uh, the, any arithmetic of coefficients is all one? Yes. Right? And when you yes. move to integers, then length will matter. Yes. So that's why there's really an equivalence here. Actually, uh, if you're very uh, astute, you'll observe that the matrix on the right is the matrix on the left evaluated at x equals 10. Um, so there's really an equivalence between computationally between integers and polynomials many times, uh, and the you know equivalent thing to evaluating a polynomial at a point, a univariate polynomial is to take an integer mod a chosen prime, and and a lot of the things just kind of flow flow either way. So when we talk about integers, it's not actually getting easier from the polynomial problem. It's mm -hmm. it's actually getting harder. Um, because you have other weird things about growth with integers that aren't so nice as with polynomials. Yes, thank you for asking. Okay, a useful tool is we want to reduce, we're dealing with integer matrices. A lot of these problems have already been solved for matrices with coefficients in a finite field. And so the useful tool is to reduce your integer matrix with potentially huge entries to a matrix um, over a finite field with smaller, controllable size entries where we know how to do things. And we can do that, and just this is a statement which may be obvious to you, um, maybe not, but it's really important to be able to do any of this, which is to say that we can reduce a matrix mod a prime and not change the um, crucial properties of it, in particular without changing the rank. So, by choosing a prime that has not too many bits, log of d plus log of n, where d is the size of the uh, integers. Um, if you choose randomly a prime with that many bits, then probably it'll preserve the rank of the original matrix. And that's just straightforward stuff based on the Hadamard bound. And because this, this bit length of the primes is quite small, and in order to make the talk simpler and uh, easier to follow. The, I'm just going to assume that the size of the primes is uh, word size. And I think it's a reasonable assumption based on some back of the envelope calculation that I've done so far. Great. So now we have, uh, for the first time, now that I've been promising you, now we have some meat, some actual uh, verification algorithm. So here's what it looks like. We have a prover and a verifier. Uh, and I'm not writing it out as formally as we did in the paper, um, so let me explain what the meaning is of the things we're seeing. So the matrix A is assumed to be public knowledge, and the claim that's being verified is that that matrix is non-singular, so that matrix is uh, full rank. And how does this work is that the prover starts by choosing a prime. Uh, the prover sends this prime P over to the verifier, and after that, the verifier choose a random challenge vector um, of length n over GFP. So the verifier chooses n values uh, from 0 up to p minus 1 and sends that challenge vector to the prover. And the prover responds with a response vector w such that this verification should pass. Um, so the verifier will check that A mod P times W is equal to C. So what's happened here is that the prover gets to choose a finite field to map down into. We're starting out over the integers, but the prover is going to choose a prime, so we're working modulo that prime. Why is the prover able to do that is because um, 
by working modulo prime, you can only reduce the rank. So if we're trying, if the prover is trying to convince you that it, this matrix has full rank, then the prover shouldn't choose a prime that reduces it. Um, so we we so if the prover is doing their job, they will choose a good prime there. And then what the verifier is doing is challenging to say that, hey, if this matrix is really non-singular, then you should be able to um, do a linear system solve for any, any vector. And so that's what the challenge is, and the prover responds, and, and that um, completes the verification. So at the end of the day, all the verifier has to do is pick this random vector over a small finite field, and then run a matrix vector product again, over uh, the finite field mod p. It's important to say that this, this verification doesn't actually involve any multiplication of large integers. That would be too costly according to our model um, because that would be more than linear time. It would be some kind of softly linear time in the size there. So we really don't want to do any expensive computations. The verifier just reduces the matrix he has mod p then multiplies it by this small vector and checks that it's equal to the challenge. So here's a, an example of this protocol running. Again, we're saying that the matrix A, the, the input is public data. And I guess you could also say the other piece of public data is the bit of that it's claimed that this matrix is non-singular. OK, so um, how does the protocol work? We can view it as kind of filling in the pieces of an equation. So the first thing that happens is that the prover chooses a prime. Uh, for this particular example, um, 17 is what my random prover chose. So the, that's sent to the verifier. And then after that prime is chosen, the verifier picks a challenge vector modulo that prime called C. So I'm using blue and green to show you what's chosen by the prover and what's chosen by the verifier. After that. Uh, the prover computes this um, solution, this claim solution vector W, which is going to be a solution to the linear system, hopefully. And then the last step is for the verifier to actually check that. So the verifier computes the public A modulo P, so it reduces the matrix to this nice small thing, then carries out the computation and, and checks it. And it really has to go in that order in order for everything to work out correctly, but uh, then it does. So for completeness, what, what are you trying to say is that um, we know that a correct claim will always be verified, verifiable. And that really comes down to saying that there's a way for the prover to choose a prime p so that the matrix mod p is still non-singular, so that you, he can actually solve the system from the challenge vector. And um, we already said from our lemma before that that's always going to be possible with a small p. For soundness, how does the verifier know that, um, that something really worked? Well, we already know from previous results that this method of uh, sending a random challenge vector over the finite field proves with high probability that the matrix is non-singular over the finite field. So then the only missing part of the soundness argument there is just the fact that the rank can only decrease modulo a prime. So the fact that the matrix is non-singular modulo that prime means that it's definitely also non-singular over the, over the integers. Uh, and then the communication is just big O of n, just sending that challenge vector in response. And the verifier's time is n squared d. That's the size of the matrix, because there's n squared entries, and they each have d bits. And the prover's complexity is n to the omega d. The prover has to do a little bit more work, but that's kind of expected because uh, they did the original computation in the first place. And then we get a lot more from that. Uh, so I. I questions. Yes, please. Um, so, will you clarify? So, this is uh, the, uh, so the last line is how much it will take uh, to check, to find the w, right? Or whatever. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, to do a, a dense linear system solve. And in comparison to uh, actually uh, getting the you know, dance in the first place, how much time does that take? The same. Same. Yeah. So to, to uh, actually, I think I even missed it. I think you can say the prover's time is n to the omega plus, plus n squared d. But anyway, it's, 
it's not a wrong statement because that's still big O of n to the omega d. Anyway, um, yeah, so the, the cost of doing the actual matrix factorization to, let's say, do an LU um, decomposition to really prove that the matrix is non-singular would cost n to the omega d time with some log factors. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, we would like the plus line to be kind of smaller, right? Or, or, or no. No. no, 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 this is what we want it to be. Yeah, so we want the prover to do the same amount of work. Essentially, what you can say is that the prover just has to keep the, say, LU decomposition from when they computed that originally. I then, and, then they, and then it would be much easier for them. Then it would be uh, N, squared, N squared D time. So, so are you saying that if they have clock, then it will take less or not? Or if they have clock, like, you know, stopwatch, they measure the seconds. Yeah. Is that supposed to take less? Is that what the, uh, the actual thing, or do you want to operate with this old thing? And oh, so you're asking, what does the big O complexity mean anything in terms of actual running time? Well, uh, when you uh, originally stated the expectations for this, did you actually mean does this kind of thing with the big O, or you actually meant to compare it in practice how it will run? Uh, it would be interesting to compare in practice, but we haven't done that yet. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah. Um, but you expect that it will be faster because something was already yeah, that's, you will be that's exactly right. So, so, and the reason why I didn't say that is because one of the benefits of doing this kind of a verification is that we don't want to impose on the prover how to do their job. So the prover is free to actually do the computation how they like, and then this verification will work regardless. Um, and so we can imagine a possibility for the, uh, for the prover to, uh, <laughs> as I'm very used to this, I teach uh, midshipmen in the Naval Academy, they fall asleep every day. Um, so yeah, the, we can imagine that the prover computes an LU decomposition and computes a prime where the rank does not decrease and that the prover saves this data. <laughs> That's good. It's very warm in here too, so it's uh, very comfortable. Um, yeah, so if the prover is, is actually saving that data, then they'll be able to respond to challenges like this more quickly. But uh, this is assuming that the prover didn't save anything and they have to start over from scratch. And what, our, what the stated goal that I had was is simply that this should not be more than a cost to do the original computation. Somehow, I'm thinking of a model where the prover is Google. I don't, I don't care about them wasting a little bit of time. I care more about my own time not being wasted, like the verifier's time being less. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, what determines how many columns would be enough Yes. Why not two or three? Well, what 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 the term that that would be a norm? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, and I forget. In this case, it's usually has to do with the size of the underlying field. So I for, I don't want to say this for sure off the top of my, my head, but for some of these, like the probability of uh, you. So what's what's the thing that could go wrong here? Is that maybe this matrix is actually low rank, but unluckily, the challenge vector, I shouldn't point, I should use this thing. Unluckily, the challenge vector that the verifier chose just happens to be in that um, linear span of that low rank matrix. So that can happen, but it's with low probability, and I think the probability is at most one over the size of the field. So if you have a very small field, a very small prime, then you may have to run this a few more times, but it depends on how much confidence you need in the correctness. Uh, another question. Yeah. Um, so could you say again, uh, so you want the, the yes answer to be, uh, so, uh, because I forgot. So yeah, that's, that's fine. So if the claim is true, if this matrix is really non-singular, then it should always be possible for the prover to succeed. Uh -huh. and, and it is. And, and so for the non-singular question, yes corresponds to what? It is non-singular. It is non-singular. Uh, then so maybe 
Could you show again the, 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 uh, the protocol? No, the, the next, yeah, the next slide. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, so is that really the case here? Isn't the other way around? No, so if the matrix is really non-singular, because it's important that the prover chooses the prime P. So the prover gets to pick a P, maybe they have to try a few of them, but they get to pick and send the P to the verifier. But if the rank drops. But they won't pick a P that the, if the rank drops in, they should pick a different P and send that one. How do they know? Because they have the matrix and they're the prover. They have N to the omega D time to check the rank. So that, yeah, so that's, that's the reason why. Uh, again, if you think about, we don't want to impose restrictions on the prover, but if you imagine that they've computed, say, an LU decomposition, then it's easy for the prover to, the prover actually has the determinant um, and can just take the determinant mod P. And if P is a factor of the determinant, then the prover should choose a different P. And since that's the first step of the protocol, the prover has total flexibility over choosing a P which is good for them. What you're saying, it sounds like you're an auditor for a vicious prover. Is that the case? Is that the kind of model? I'm an auditor for a... Vicious pr prover. Yeah, yeah, like a malicious prover. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so we're allowing that the prover may be very powerful, may have a lot of time, and may be really trying hard to trick us for some reason. They may be really convinced in tricking us that this singular matrix is actually non-singular. And uh, there's a low probability that they will be able to do that. Um, but if, uh, again, I think one of, the, one of the places where this comes up is in thinking about, people talk about some of these things for like payment models. Um, and sometimes these verification things, not to my knowledge any of the linear algebra ones, but some of the other ones um, get used even in blockchains and stuff like that where there's actually money at stake. And so it's a way of saying, did you really do this computation? Prove it to me now. Um, and so you can think of the, the prover is trying to be cheap, is trying to just tell you an answer even though it's wrong and get paid anyway. Uh, and the verifier is trying to save money to make sure that they have their money worth. But that's why the, the completeness fact is important. It would be a bad um, system if the honest and good prover that has a correct fact was not able to get paid just from some unluckiness of choosing primes. So that's why it's actually important. In, in the next protocol, we'll see it's important that the verifier chooses the prime. And this is just the example of the kind of the carefulness that we have to have when we're designing these protocols. So in this case, it's important that the prover chooses the prime so that an honest prover can only succeed. And uh, if one looks at the algorithms that will typically have uh, symbolic computation, mm -hmm. do you actually ever have vicious provers or, or not? Uh, maybe. <laughs> that's a... Right, yeah, maybe, maybe we have and we didn't know it. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay. So it's, the point is that you don't really lose much by doing this verification because it's quite cheap. Uh, and you then don't have to ask that question of, do I trust this thing at all? You have no trust. You just verify it. Um, OK, so there's a bunch of other things that come out of that. This is not the end of my talk. Um, but this, is the, this is the first half. Oh my god. Damn it. OK, so I, this, all this time, I was thinking I can waste a lot of time because I have so little to say. But uh, I, I won't take too much of your time, too much more. But yeah, I want to answer your question. question. Just like you're doing uh, hypothesis testing, uh, we associate some kind of level of confidence for the hypothesis testing, right? So mm -hmm. you kind of compare. Uh, for this certification also, is there some kind of percentage of... Uh, like some a priori? Some, some number that allows you to compare one certificate with, with, with another... Oh, sure. Yeah, well, you could compare the probability of uh, being tricked, essentially. But it's, but it's, in this case, you have to really put that into the context of the cost, because you could run the same verification twice in a row, and now you've um, squared your, your, you've uh, squared your probability of failure, you know, making it much smaller. Um, so, 
uh, you could make a fair comparison of saying for the same failure probability, which is the fastest algorithm, or for the same speed of algorithm, which gives you the best failure probability. Um, but the, there's been no other papers that I'm aware of that address the problem of verification specifically for polynomial matrices or for integer matrices, and except for the generic solutions, and we're definitely much faster than them. So uh, it's kind of early days in this line of work, maybe, where it, it's easy to win that game um, if you're focusing on a specific problem. So this is just me saying that uh, we looked at non-singularity, but all these other things also fall out in a similar way, with diff slightly different variants on the way that you do it, but they mostly boil down to choosing a prime, reducing modulo that prime, then sending some kind of a challenge vector back and forth, and, and checking. And what you'll notice is that uh, sometimes the verifier chooses P, sometimes the prover chooses, so actually usually the verifier has to choose the, the prime field. In the non-singularity case, it's a bit weird that the prover chooses the prime, but that kind of varies as you go between um, different algorithms. OK, so I won't take all of your time. Some people are already falling asleep uh, to. Uh, Maybe it's OK to think that so the next class, if it starts as a 415. OK. So I think we still have time. So I'll take a few more minutes. Um, but the next problem I want to show you, I want to ask you now. What is wrong with this protocol? So this is moving to a different problem, which is the problem is to test whether a given vector is in the integer uh, lattice of another of a, of a given matrix. So you have a vector, a row vector, and you have a matrix, and you want to know, is this vector in that lattice or not? So the protocol which I'm suggesting, and I'm telling you in advance that it's flawed, is that the verifier chooses a prime. So this is kind of the same flavor as uh, the previous results. Um, the verifier chooses a prime, so you reduce modulo that prime. Then the prover sends back the vector modulo that prime that shows that this is in the linear span of A mod P. So what this is checking is that the vector mod P is really in the linear span of A modulo P. That's what the vector W here proves. And what I want you to tell me is why is this not sufficient to prove that V is in the original lattice? Yeah, but over a field, right? You, you just, if your momentum is invertible, you're, you're very good. Um, that's right. That's kind of, so it's, it's about it being a field versus a ring. So it's the fact that the integers are a ring, and when we reduce mod p, now we have a field. And so things uh, which, the, the real problem is that if the vector that we had was in the rational span of the original matrix, but not the integer span, as in the lattice, then this protocol would always succeed. And so it doesn't distinguish from whether something is just in the lattice or actually, or it just in the rational span of that matrix or in the lattice. And in particular, if we had a square non-singular matrix here, this would say that every vector um, could pass this test. When we know that there's plenty of square matrices that are non-singular that don't um, cover every uh, integer point in the lattice. And so the, uh, another way of saying that is that the row span of the matrix over the integers is a module. It's not actually a vector space. So we can't do this reduction to a smaller vector space uh, when, like mod p because we're losing that module structure when we do. And the trick in this case is to do that verification, so to do this flawed verification, but to add another commitment on top of it. And the commitment that we add on top of it um, will be a projection of the full solution, uh, and we have them do that before, sending, before we send the prime p. So what we're going to do is do a commitment that happens over the integers, not over any mod p, followed by this mod p check, and then a final um, kind of consistency check that the mod p solution that we got is consistent with the original commitment over the integers. Um, 
So what we what what's happening is that this would be like the full. Oh yeah, I forgot to not touch. So this this here V A inverse would be like the full integer um, solution, but it may be very large. The bits the bit length of that vector may be huge. So we can, do we don't have the time to send that. Um, or if even if the verifier received that, you wouldn't have time to compute with it or do anything to check with it. But what we'll do is send a projection of it, so a, a random linear combination of that vector, and that will allow us to check the mod p solution later. So here's what the protocol ends up looking like. Um, what you see is that the flawed protocol is living right inside here. So if I drew a box around this, the last two communications in the first check is exactly the same as that flawed protocol of just checking the vector space computation, mod p. And then what we do before that starts is we send a random challenge vector to the prover and have the prover send back a single integer, which is the sum of uh, this random linear combination from the true solution vector. So then this last check here checks that the, uh, the vector that we got um, proving that it's in the span mod p is actually consistent with the original integer g that we got here. So it's doing that vector space computation, but now we have to do some extra work to check that it's actually preserving the module structure itself. Um, and it adds another round of communication and that other complication to it. Uh, so maybe that wasn't so clear. Let's look at an example. Maybe this will also be unclear, but it'll be fun. Um, so here's the vector and the matrix. Again, we assume that this is public data. So the claim is that this vector is in the lattice uh, formed by this matrix here. All right, so the first thing that happens is the verifier chooses a challenge vector, which is going to be a linear combination to be applied to the true um, solution vector that would prove that this uh, vector is in the lattice. So after that, the prover commits to this single integer value. Um, it's potentially a large integer value because it's a sum of this times entries from the, anti from the solution there, but um, but it's only one integer, so it's okay that it's a little bit larger. Maybe you can't tell that negative 13 is large, but in this context it is. Um, and then after that, only after the prover is committed, then the verifier chooses the prime, in this case uh, 13. And then uh, finally the prover sends back the solution vector w. And now the verifier is able to check. Um, so this is sort of the original flawed check. And on top of that flawed check, the verifier does the second one to confirm that the original commitment was really legitimate. So what happens is that if um, I'm going to skip ahead to the, the soundness proof here. So the claim is that the original vector is in the integer row span, so in the lattice um, of the original matrix. And so there's kind of two cases to consider for, for um, the soundness. If the vector is not even in the rational row span, then that first flawed check will, will find it. We'll find that it wasn't in the rational row span, so you can't um, do a solve. And in the case that it is in the rational row span, but not in the integer row span, then what we'll have is that there is a unique and truly rational um, solution to a u equals v. And the prover is obligated to send um, u mod p as w. And then what we have is we have to think about the probability that a rational, a truly rational vector times an integer vector gives you an integer vector. And because the verifier is choosing c, the probability that this dot product is an integer is high. Because you have something with actual denominators in the rational numbers times a random linear combination, you're probably not going to cancel out the denominators. Um, and because of that, that means that for most primes p, this equation can't be satisfied. And then that's why that second check will fail with high probability. But there's actually a lot of points of failure here. So the analysis here gets more hairy. You have to kind of in order to um, have a high, high probability of confidence in the result that you get back. Um, so this is an example of a computation of verification over modules that, as you can see, gets a little bit more involved, a little bit more hairy.
because we can't just kind of reduce mod p and then take all the existing machinery. So I actually don't understand now. Okay. Uh, that for, uh, uh, you only sort of care about the yes answer. We care about both answers. Um, no, what we care about is being tricked. So what we care about is that the original claim is false. We're trying to check that the original claim is not false. So we have to care about both sides. Um, the completeness is caring about the yes answer, kind of, making sure that it's possible for an honest prover to succeed. But that's kind of easier in this case. The more intricate thing is proving that a, a dishonest prover, if you're being lied to, that you will actually find out. We didn't specify probability. That's yes, that's right, that's right. But that probability is independent of anything else. It's independent of what V and A look like. So that means that you can repeat this verification as many times as you need uh, in order to have the confidence level that you want. So again, there's, this, is a, this is an independent, in case you don't memorize the list from the previous one, this is another list. This is a list of, of problems that are more like over the module space that we were also able to solve and, and come up with efficient verification algorithms for. So um, things like Hermit form and Popov form. Uh, this, this row space membership turns about to be kind of the crucial linchpin in getting all of this to work. So once you can do row space membership, then you can do row space equivalence. Then you can start to think about proving that something is a basis for something else. And then uh, a lot of these other things kind of fall out. It's not to say that it wasn't work to do all of those other ones, but um, that, that row space membership is kind of the, the crucial step there. So I wanted to end uh, with this. Uh, so there's uh, some quotes. This is from 1987. That's uh, Gorbachev, I guess, with Ronald Reagan, where Ronald Reagan liked to say, trust but verify, which he claimed was a Russian proverb, but I don't know if that's true at all. Um, I also wrote, don't really know what trust but verify means. But anyway, um, that's something that he said. And uh, in the Iran nuclear deal from 2015 that was signed um, between not just the United States and Iran, but a bunch of other countries, uh, there's a quote from President Obama when he announced that, that it was not built on trust, but verification. Um, so verification seems to be important. Does anybody know what these two treaties have in common? Back out of both of them afterwards, right? Yes, uh, the current administration has decided to back out of both of them. So, um, <laughs> the, yeah, so I don't know if that says something about uh, someone who thinks that, uh, that Putin and um, Kim Jong-il are to be believed at their word. But I'm, anyway, I'm on the side of verification. So I'm happy to put my, my stamp in that one. Um, so this is just a summary of what I said we can do get these nice complexities for everything. You're more interested in the next slide, which is what we can't do. Um, so I showed you everything with integers, but actually we haven't completed those proofs and that's some kind of future work. And uh, the row space membership in particular, that crucial algorithm, it seems like that should work with integers, but the proof technique that we have now is really specific to polynomials and we're not sure how to extend it to integers yet. So that's an interesting challenge. Um, there's also a lot of other polynomial problems that don't fit into this uh, framework. Even though I showed you a nice long list and you're impressed, there's actually some really important ones that we don't know how to handle yet, uh, like Smith form, um, Hermit Pidey approximation, even matrix inverse. Um, so yeah, then there's some extra log factors and things to improve along that lines. Um, so I want to thank you again. This is a picture of where I was um, last winter when I was in France. And so I want to say again thanks to my, my co-authors on this who did all the hard work, of course. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me up. So what's the difficulty in matrix inverse? Um, the difficulty is, yeah, that's a fair so question. Given the matrix and its inverse, no, that's inverses. no, that's easy, okay. because you can check the multiplication. Uh, okay, and what are you doing? So then I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know what I don't know why this is on my slide. So if you're given the matrix and it's inverse, you can definitely check it because you can check the multiplication, uh, and that's sufficient. I guess you would want to check that the multiplication is zero is identity and that it's non singular, and we have that certificate. So no, I don't know what that's doing there. There's another problem which is um, well, maybe, maybe I got confused. Is, is that because it's polynomial? Uh, yes, maybe, but you can still... But if you, if, if you multiply, right, this will be n, n to the omega, not n squared, right? You, no. You want, you want to, do, to, do, to verify things in the size of input. Yes, that's true, but there is there is a ver efficient verification for matrix multiplication, ah, so you which can, is that you just you multiply, you essentially multiply by a random vector, Mm -hmm. one at a time, and uh, then check if that equals to, in the case of identity, you would just check if it equals your original vector. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay. not sure what I mean by matrix inverse. Um, there may be a mistake in my part, or maybe a mistake in my current thinking, and I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, finding the inverse is still uh, uh, n to the amigo or, or more? Yes. Uh, well, I, at least it's n to the omega d, maybe more. Um, I think it's just n to the omega d. There's a recent paper by Storyhan and there's someone else um, that is a very nice algorithm for building up that matrix inverse in actually a factored form as you go. Um, and I think that's n to the omega times d. More questions? Thank you. Yep.